Hey, this is Maklat from Tigerbido. Today, I will take you on a walk down Tigerbido's main street and explain how to implement a fully deterministic distributed system which can be easily tested on a single laptop. Usually, I talk about Rust and compilers, but today's talk is about databases and it uses Zeek. Let's dive in. The database in question is Tigerbido. Tigerbido is small, fast database for financial accounting. Very narrow domain allows us to focus on reliability and speed to an unreasonable degree, necessitating rethinking our overall approach to programming. Tagamital is written in a particular style called target style. It is many things, but the core pillar is determinism. By eliminating variation between different runs of software, we achieve many goals. We improve developer productivity. All bugs become easily reproducible bugs, and sharing commit hash and the seed for a random number generator is enough to reproduce a bug. We reduce performance variability. If something is slow, it is slow deterministically every time, so latencies remain predictable and stable. Finally, determinism even helps with throughput. A large part of it is replacing dynamic resource management with static resource management, which requires less infrastructure and tracking at runtime. It is roughly clear how to build such systems. You carefully defi uh, define the interface between your deterministic system and the world, which changes unpredictably. There is some kind of a discrete event simulation test hardness, and you also do something about time. In this talk, I will get to specifics and demonstrate how such a system is actually implemented. There is a lot of code on the slides, but that's the point. The code is in Zeek because that's what Tagovedo is written in. Zeek is sufficiently syntactically close to other popular languages like Rust, so this shouldn't be a problem. Let's start uh, right at me. The code on the slides is slightly modified to fit but otherwise is taken directly from the real uh, project. In our main, the first thing we do is creating an I.O. object highlighted on the slide. That is, we don't use the language provided ambient I.O. capability like stdfs, and instead we pass I.O. as an argument to everything that can have side effects. This allows us to easily mock I.O. It's important to do this approach from the one. Otherwise, refactoring the global ambient I.O. to an I.O. object would be a huge pain because basically every line in the system needs to change. For Tango Middle, we pass I.O. to two distinct components, storage for disk access and message bus for networking. For our simulation testing, we actually mock at this layer. We mock storage and network rather than mocking I.O. directly. This allows injecting more nefarious coordinated failures. Still, passing I.O. object around makes it clear what you have to mock. You can mock any set of components that shields the rest of the system from input and output. Now, let's look at the heart of the system, where everything happens. Uh, this is the main loop of Targabital, which literally drives everything. There are two interesting aspects about this code. First, we are running with discrete time. Every 16 milliseconds, we call the tick function on a replica. A replica tracks the number of ticks a labs internally and uses this number of ticks to drive timers rather than actual physical timing. This is how a game could be run. The benefit here is that pushing time into the system is much easier to virtualize and to mock than using set timeout shaped APIs. The drawback here is that uh, the time is not precise. Uh, you only get 15 milliseconds resolution, but you actually don't need higher resolution for timeouts. On the contrary, you would love to randomize them or to add exponential backup, so that's okay. 
The second interesting aspect of this code is that this is a literal while true loop written inside Charlie Biddle's main function. Usually, uh, in event architectures, uh, the input output is handled by some bigger framework, and the main loop is hidden uh, from the programmer through inversion of control. But only in your event loop streamlines control flow and simplifies debugging and instrumentation. But there is actually a more important killer feature here. And this is it. You can take several event loops and stitch those together. This is the main of our deterministic simulator, which drives most of our tests. Here, we are running an entire cluster of several replicas and multiple clients at the same time. Recall that we mock input output at the level of network and storage. So we need to tick those two mocked components as well. Crucially, unlike the real main, there is no explicit run for 15 milliseconds line. So uh, these loops run just as fast as the CPU allows for it. As a result, the performance of our simulator is completely independent of the wall clock time and depends only on the performance of our code. This, in turn, allows us to test millions of interesting randomized interlinings of events during normal day-to-day -day development and CI. We don't need to spin up the real cluster on AWS just to test something. A laptop can simulate the whole cluster. And that's the first part of uh, determinism in practice. You want to control, to drive yourself, time and ordering of I.O. events explicitly. Let's move to the second part. Let's move on to deterministic space. We'll be looking at a client session's data structure. Uh, this is a hash map which maps a random client identifier to some information about a client. The data stru structure itself is not that important. This pattern is repeated throughout the trigabital. And the pattern is the unbundled allocated pattern. The idea here is that uh, the general purpose allocator, GPA, is explicitly passed in a constructor. The constructor uses it to pre-allocate all the required resources, in this case, the hash map of an appropriate size. And crucially, the constructor doesn't store this allocator everywhere. That means that when we treat the data structure subsequently, as in the put method, we don't pass the allocator in. So the put has to get by only with the memory allocated during the startup in constructor. Here, Zeek helps tremendously. In Zeek, all cache map APIs that could allocate need the allocator parameter. So by not passing the allocator into this method, we statically guarantee that no allocation could happen. This is great. You know you won't get any tail latency spike due to an unfortunate hash map resize when handling uh, some request. But it also feels kind of hard to do. If you allocate everything at the startup, you need to provide an explicit upper bounds for the amount of clients you can handle. But actually, this is easier than it sounds. Uh, the reason for that is that every data structure without an explicit upper bound is a back pressure uh, problem waiting to happen. If you're going to design your system with back pressure in mind, you are going to have some upper bounds anyway. And if you have upper bounds anyway, you might as well just exploit them further to simplify the system and make it more performant by getting rid of dynamic memory allocations. There is also an extra side benefit here. Uh, this style of API, which allocates only during startup and otherwise makes allocation very awkward, forces zero copy design. That is because to do a memory copy, you need to have some extra memory to copy the data into. And if allocating memory is hard and requires extra bookkeeping, then it often is simpler to just not do this extra memory copy and use the data directly. There is a one lingering doubt here, though, uh, with this explicit upper bound idea. Who stores input-output callbacks? 
with a typical async input output, you might want to enqueue many concurrent I.O. operations. And someone, somewhere, has to store all in-flight requests in some sort of a queue. It feels kind of hard to predict uh, the size of this I.O. queue upfront, as there might be many concurrent I.O. operations in flight from different sources. For example, write-ahead logs need to write to disk. Log-structured merge tree needs to write to disk. Network needs to write to sockets. All those things uh, submit I.O. requests, and it might be hard to coordinate an upper bound uh, on all those I.O. operations at the same time. The solution uh, here is to turn this time problem of management of managing concurrent callbacks into a space problem of static allocation of I.O. operations. Each component that needs uh, to do I.O. allocates a fixed number of I.O. slots private to this component. Here, IOPS are just arrays with comp time fixed size. Each component is responsible for not issuing more I.O. requests uh, than it has I.O. slots. So if it needs to do I.O. and there is no free I.O. slots in IOPS, it needs to handle this situation uh, somehow by, for example, dropping requests on the floor, propagating back pressure to the caller, or maybe uh, adding the high-level request to some uh, sort of a uh, back of queue, which, of course, is also uh, bounded uh, in size. The central I.O. objects then can manage I.O. requests from all components by arranging the I.O. operations in question into an intrusive linked list. And that's basically it. That's how you write a fully deterministic database with a discrete event simulation capable of executing several orders of magnitude faster than a real cluster. So let's recap. Determinism is unquestionably great. It's a systems design principle uh, which improves the systems across several dimensions. It makes uh, programmer productivity better because you can easier produce bugs, you can test systems more effectively, and you can even do some fancy combinatorial exploration of different interlinings, something which would be just much too slow for a real system. Determinism also improves runtime predictability as you manage resources statically and there is just uh, fewer random things happening at runtime. And finally, determinism improves throughput because, again, you remove dynamic memory uh, management, dynamic resource management. That means you don't need this whole infrastructure for managing resource dynamically, and managing resources statically is uh, just faster. To achieve determinism, you want to rein in variability in both space and time. For managing time, you want to explicitly thread an I.O. object uh, you want to own and control uh, your own event loop so that you can run several event loops intertwined. And you also want to run at the constant uh, frames per second and use the uh, tick callback for timers instead of explicitly scheduling timers to run at some precise point in the future. For space, the main trick is to have an explicit upper bound on everything. Then, once you have those upper bounds, uh, you can remove allocations because if you know the upper bound, you can just allocate an up memory uh, during startup. And uh, sometimes you want to modularize the handling of those upper bounds. You want to have a global upper bound for some amount of stuff, but you also want each uh, subsystem to be responsible for a part of the stuff. Uh, to do this, you want each subsystem to manage uh, its own resources and then arrange resources into global collection using intrusive linked, list, uh, linked lists. Uh, that's all. Uh, if you want to chat more about how Targetable does determinism, 
then please uh, chat with me uh, in our Slack.